I have a friend and colleague with a 1973 Mustang in Brazil. He reached out to me and asked if I would be willing to help him install his Petronix Igniter 1 primary ignition system upgrade. Well, of course I'm happy to help, but I had looked at doing a Petronix on one of our other pony cars a while ago and decided for me it wasn't worth making the change, especially because it's a 1969 Shelby GT500 and as curious as I was about Petronix, I really was apprehensive about changing it from point and condenser to electronic because first of all it runs great with points I don't race it I don't track it and I get the protons kit can add some benefit especially if someone's having a problem with their ignition point ignition system in this case I wasn't having a problem with the Shelby and we're really not having a problem with the 73 Mustang convertible, which we got after I had considered doing Petronix. I did recall that the instructions on how to install these units was a little ambiguous. It's when a person knows what to do, it's clear that what they say is correct. But for someone who's not sure what to do with the wiring, it can be confounding. So part of what I'm going to do now is not only show how to hook these things up correctly with this particular kind of car, but also show the different places we can go to get 12 volts or battery voltage of switched power which means power when the ignition key is in the run position. These run on 12 volts or battery voltage might be 13.2, 12.8, depending on what the alternator does. The reason I bring it up is because I see other YouTube videos on these Igniter 1 systems where folks very simply take the unit and the unit comes with a wire lead pack red and black what they do is they remove the ignition points which is correct Thread these through the distributor pigtail hole, which is good. Push this through the pigtail hole to secure it. Keep moisture and dust out the distributor. That's good. They connect the black wire to the negative primary ignition terminal on the coil. That's correct. But then they connect this to the positive primary terminal on the ignition coil. That isn't correct. And I'm going to explain and show why it's not correct. Now, amazingly, even though the red wire is typically put in to the ignition coil positive terminal, the car still starts to run. It's only getting partial voltage. The reason for that is on these Mustangs and a lot of Fords and other cars there is a resistor wire that leads from the ignition switch down to a wire that then feeds a positive side of the ignition coil and the resistor wire reduces the voltage from, we'll just say 12 volts, even though we all know it could be 13.8 or something, down to about 8 or 10 volts. And that's done 
allegedly to keep the points from burning out too fast. Well, that could be. There's other reasons for it, and I'll explain that in a moment. But the point is, this is designed to run on 12 volts, full battery voltage of switched power, not reduced power. So these things end up actually failing sooner than they should because it's not getting enough voltage for it to do its job. I read somewhere that Protronics is aware that's why these things are failing. I'm trying to find that article. If I can find it, I'll put it in the link in this description for this video. But anyway, I have a few objectives with this video today. One is to demonstrate voltage going to the positive side of the ignition coil in the run position and in the cranking position and then show and explain a voltage drop fallacy about full battery voltage going to the coil during cranking. And then I'll show a few different places we could tap into to get 12 volts of switched power with these cars. And of course, I'll go ahead and install this and see how well the vehicle runs, set the ignition timing, and hopefully I can do this without making any embarrassing or silly mistakes. If I do, I'll keep it in the video because, you know, I, mis I make mistakes too. I try not to make it obvious to anybody, but sometimes it happens. If you catch me, you catch me. Hopefully I catch me before you do. And, you know, when I started opening the discussion for this video, I mentioned a Protronics Igniter 1 but I didn't say why it's being installed other than I have a friend and colleague in Brazil who would like to see how it's done before he does it himself to his car. Well, 1973 and earlier, these Mustangs had a standard ignition system where the primary ignition circuit was closed and opened to a set of ignition points that are driven open and closed by a rubbing block on a distributor shaft with some cam lobes on it. So as the distributor shaft turns, these little lobes open and close, open, close, open, close the ignition points. What that does is it builds up a magnetic flux field in the ignition coil when the points are closed. When the points are open, that field collapses, and when that collapses, the magnetic lines of flux pass through the secondary windings of the ignition coil, and there's a lot more of those than there are of the ramping of the coil for the primary ignition and it causes the ignition coil to output 15, 20, 25,000 volts of very, very low amperage DC current. And the idea when that spark gets fired, that voltage gets fired, it goes through the coil wire into the distributor Distributor rotor should be pointing to an electrode on the distributor cap that has an ignition cable that leads down to a particular spark plug. So within a few microseconds, the coil collapses. <coughs> its magnetic flux field fires off high voltage to the spark plug, fires the plug, igniting the air fuel mixture inside the combustion chamber. So that's a very electromechanical process using the ignition points. And there's more to it than that, but that's the overview. 
One of the problems that we run into using ignition points is that this little cam lube and distributor shaft rubs along as it rotates on the small rubbing block, they call it, on the points. So that's what causes this thing to open and close. Well, if the lobes are not properly lubricated, I mean very, very thin coating of grease. If you get too much, it causes a problem. Very thin coat, this rubbing block will wear down. And as it wears down, the gap the points are opening gets smaller and smaller until finally they don't open enough to cause the magnetic fields, electromagnetic field and coil to collapse because they don't open enough to uh, open the circuit and spark doesn't fire. The other thing is while that rubbing block is wearing down, it is causing the dwell time or the amount of time current is sent into the coil to increase. And for every degree that the dwell is increased, we alter the ignition timing by two degrees retarded. So your engine is supposed to be, in this case, set for six degrees before top to its center. If we lose a degree of dwell, we lose two degrees of ignition advance. So I'm running at four degrees before top dead center. So the engine will not be as peppy as it should be. It'll get worse fuel mileage and it'll run a little bit warmer. None of those things we want. And of course, if the point block wears enough where the points don't even open enough to fire the spark on the ignition coil, well, then the car won't even start or run. <clears throat> so the idea is to replace that old point and condenser ignition, primary ignition system with an electronic unit where we have a pickup with two wires coming out of it and on the distributor shaft, we put a small magnetic wheel. And as the distributor rotates, that wheel rotates, there are eight magnets in the magnetic wheel. And when one goes by the pickup, it fires the system. Open that circuit and it fires the coil, collapses the magnetic field. And then when it passes it, it knows it started applying voltage again, building up dwell building up current for the coil again happens very fast. There is an air gap between the pickup and the small round magnetic wheel, which I also will call a reluctor as with other ignition systems. In any event, there's an air gap of 0 0.030 inch, three hundredths of an inch, very small. If the gap is too large, then the pickup won't sense the reluctor as it's spinning. If it's too small, then it could be picking up advanced signal because of sensitivity it has, or in worst cases, the pickup will actually rub up against that reluctor and cause damage. We don't want that. But once it is set to 0 0.030 air gap, in theory, never again do we have to adjust anything or replace anything as long as the pickup continues to work. And that's why it's important to make sure we get battery voltage, 12 volts or 13 point volts, whatever comes out of the battery, to that pickup. Getting too low a voltage, in theory, shouldn't hurt anything. But what it does, it reduces the amount of voltage that the ignition coil can fire, for one. 
And apparently, even though it's a lower voltage than wanted, it can cause the pickup to overheat. And the way we can tell these things are overheated is on the pickup, there's a white sticker with some numbers on it. If that sticker is all shriveled up and looks scorched and stuff, then the pickup overheated. And the big reason I see for that happening is when folks connect the positive red lead from that pickup to the positive primary ignition side of the ignition coil. It's kind of what they say to do in the instructions, but not really. In a link in this video description is a um, Google Drive file where I have taken the instructions that Pertronix has provided and I highlight and explain a bit about how I would have liked to do the instructions and I'll show a schematic or two or three of different places you can pick up your 12 volts from on Mustangs from 1965 and a half all the way to 1973. If you have a different model Ford pre-74, the instructions are almost exactly the same. If you have a Chrysler or a GM, it's similar, except with Chrysler, you have a balanced resistor instead of a resistor wire. But you'll get the idea if you go through what I have written carefully. That's an awful lot I just threw at you, but here's some more. I'm also going to install the Protronics flamethrower ignition coil with 1.5 ohms of internal resistance. Why did I pick this one? Well, because I'm told for six and eight cylinder engines for Ford, we want to use a 1.5 ohm internal resistor coil. Supposedly, this puts out up to 40,000 volts, they say. 40,000 available volts. And it's important to think about what they're saying. I see ignition coils from the factory where if I unplug the coil from the distributor cap and read the maximum output, I might get 18 to 24,000 volts, sometimes more. And it's enough to jump the gap on a spark plug. This can put out up to 40,000 volts. But here's a dirty little secret. Just because it can doesn't mean it will. This will output only as much voltage as is required to jump the gap on the spark plug. From then on, any energy that is built up either takes longer to dissipate it all before the spark line disappears, or it just does eight, nine, ten thousand volts, whatever it does, it jump the gap and it's over. The rest of it, as the fuel collapses, gets absorbed in its windings, and I can show that to you with an oscilloscope later on. Personally, I would not have replaced the coil on our car because the one from the factory works fine and it will work fine with Bertronics. But my friend in Brazil picked up a kit that included the coil and Bertronics and a set of ignition cables. It's not going to hurt anything. And 40,000 volts sounds really exciting, but he's going to see this video. I realized having 40,000 volts doesn't mean you're going to get 40,000 volts. You get what the spark plug requires to jump the gap. That's it. But that's okay. And if you have a spark plug that takes 30 or 40,000 volts to jump the gap, you got bigger problems with the ignition system than trying to figure out what parts to put in and why. One thing I didn't mention because I thought it might be intuitively obvious 
With the Protronics ignition system, which is all electronic, as long as the pickup does not fail, and when we run it with battery voltage like we're supposed to, it should last forever. This will do just that, last forever. We don't have to replace it. Ignition points, we're supposed to replace those every 12,000 miles or 12 months, whichever comes first. Hopefully before the rubbing block ends up wearing down and cause the volts to, uh, points to close up and cause problems with the ignition system. And it's not hard to replace ignition points and a condenser in a car, but doing it once a year, it can become a monotonous pain in the tail. With Retronics or another electronic ignition system, those days are gone. The dwell doesn't drift, the timing doesn't drift because of the ignition points wearing down, and this never closes a gap that causes the ignition system to fail. So that's some of the benefit of having this unit going in. Another is that allegedly it will increase the performance of an engine. Well, I'm not going to say I disagree with that. I think that the way it's worded is perhaps what I would rather focus on. It can improve the performance of an engine. If the old original ignition system has a problem, points are closing up, for instance, ignition coil has a problem, then replacing it with these parts will indeed increase the performance. But if the system is running well with conventional points and condenser, it won't do much of anything except keep on having to replace parts every year. What I'm going to do now is start taking the air filter assembly off the engine and show a few places where we can pick up voltage in the ignition key at run position. So it's switched battery power. This is always so much fun taking this apart. Okay. Thank you. I have a test light I'm going to use instead of a voltmeter, and the reason is that it's easy for me to work with this, and it has a voltmeter display built in. So what I do before I test any circuits, I put the negative on any good ground, and I'm going to try here. And then I touch this to the battery to make sure the light comes on. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. I can't begin to tell you how frustrating it is to use a test light to test things only to find out that, well, they burned out. <laughs> okay. First thing I'm going to do is go down to the ignition coil. This is with the ignition key in the run position and check the positive and negative side of the primary ignition. I have voltage. Can you get a close up of the voltage? 
Okay, that shows, I gotta see how many volts that was. See the voltage? Yeah, but I'm trying to get to what you're touching now. Okay. okay. I cannot read that very well. Let's look at this. Six point three volts. As opposed to battery voltage at twelve point zero, twelve point one. That is because of the resistor wire that reduces the battery voltage in the run position from 12 volts to 6 volts. When the engine is cranked over, we have a starter relay. And on the starter relay, there are two big terminals, battery, starter and two small terminals and the small terminals are marked the front one has a letter s for start the one over here red with the blue stripe is marked i for ignition this i terminal has a wire that basically is connected electrically to the positive primary ignition terminal on the coil. I can demonstrate this by touching, and there's your 6.4 volts, just like we had over here. Why would they do that? Because when the engine is cranked over and power is sent through the ignition switch, and if you have a neutral safety switch with automatic transmission, through the transmission, the starter relay gets a full signal saying to a little copper disc inside electromechanically driven it goes up and causes the battery positive terminal side to connect to the starter motor side for the starter motor cable and cranks the engine over when that happens your voltage from the battery drops down to 10 and a half to 9.6 volts or so. I'll demonstrate this. First, I don't want the engine to start, so I'm going to unplug the coil wire. So if that coil fires off, it won't go to a spark plug. It might cause a spark here. <laughs> we'll see. So what I'll do is I'll show how many volts we're getting through here during cranking. Right now it's 6.4. Can you see it okay? Mm -hmm. 9.9 .9 to 10.2. Well, wait a minute. Didn't someone in shop class say that when you crank the engine you get a full 12 volts to the coil? They probably said that, yes. They can't. Because the battery cannot produce more voltage than 9.9 .9 to 10.2 as the engine's cranking over, in our case. It's supposed to be 9.6 volts, 10 and a half volts. So this ignition bypass from the starter relay does not send 12 volts to that coil only about 10 volts. It's more than the 6.6 .6 we get with the ignition key in the run position, but the point is you're not getting 12 volts. 12 volts is not there to be had. The battery can't produce that as it's cranking over the engine. So, 
What this means is that when you connect your Protronics positive wire, that's why you can't put it on the positive terminal of the coil, because instead of getting 12 volts, you're going in 6.6. .6. You can't attach it over here to this terminal on the starter relay for the same reason. That then begs the question, well then, where do we get our voltage from? Well, on the 1971 through 73 Mustangs, there were two relatively easy ways to get full battery voltage with a car in run position. I'll show them to you. In order to test the windshield wiper motor power, the ignition key, first of all, is in run position. I'm going to use a special test light that hooks a wire and then pierces the insulation with a sharp tip because it's really hard to get back there and do this. So I found the red wire. And that's coming from the windshield washer? It's for the windshield wiper power. And now the light is on, so that's power. I'm going to turn off the key to demonstrate this is switch power. The light will go off in just a moment. Yep. Okay, key is back on. The light is back on. That's one place you can get power, and it is protected by a fuse and the fuse block. The other place is off a unit, if you still have it, called the throttle position solenoid. And there's a red wire with yellow hash. I don't know if you can get a close up of that. And whenever the ignition is run position, there's power going to this, which I will demonstrate here on the pigtail side. There's a light. Power's off. Back in run position. Now, there is another way that I can get power that is activated by the ignition switch. It's a bit more complex, needlessly complex, I feel, and that's to put in a relay and activate it from either of these two voltage sources or with a 1973 Mustang, you have an electric choke and it gets power. It's not direct current power. It comes off the stator terminal on the alternator is alternating current and it's one half of alternator output. So you only get six or seven volts, positive, negative, positive, negative, but for a relay, that's enough to close the relay points so you can take source power and point it to the pickup for the Protronics system. That's not what I recommend doing. It's more complex than necessary. If anybody wants to know how to do that, send me a note through the comments below in this video. I read the comments, I respond to the comments, and if you have need to see how that's done, I'll do a special segment for you. Now, I mentioned earlier that the one reason why these units sometimes make an engine seem like it's doing better is because there was a prior issue and this fixed it, like points closing up or something. Well, this is a good time to check something else to make sure it's working properly. And that is on the distributor, something called the vacuum advanced diaphragm, this silver looking canister. 
two things I want to check for for sure actually three one is to make sure I'm getting vacuum from the carburetor to the hose that plugs into the vacuum immense diaphragm the other is to make sure that the vacuum advanced diaphragm is not ruptured. The third thing I would like to do is make sure that when the car is running and I apply vacuum through a vacuum tester and I um, have the engine idling, the idle speed goes up as the advance kicks in. Now the other thing I'm going to be doing before I start replacing stuff, I'm going to use my sun oscilloscope to show primary and secondary ignition patterns before Petronas goes in and compare it to after. Mostly because I'm curious, not that there's something wrong. Okay, let's see. If you can hand me that silver tester. This is a vacuum tester. As I pull back on this knob, it pulls a vacuum up here. I plug it into the diaphragm, and now you see the needle is on zero. As I pull this back, it should go up and stay. If it does not come up or if it starts to bleed off like that, then either you have a bad diaphragm or someone opened up the bleed off valve on your tester. <laughs> so that diaphragm is good as far as not leaking. Now, I want to make sure we're getting vacuum down here. See that black dial up there? Let me have you hand that to me, please. This is a vacuum gauge. I'm going to simply connect it. now you see you have zero inches of mercury I'm going to start the engine and then demonstrate what ported vacuum does one moment Pardon me? The dial didn't move. No, it's not supposed oh, to be yet. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Zero inches of mercury. When I open up the throttle on the carburetor, that will move. So, we're getting vacuum. Now let's make sure the vacuum does something. I'll apply vacuum and the engine RPM should go up. I'll do it again. And the RPM definitely went up. So what that tells me is that ported vacuum from the carburetor is making it down to the vacuum advanced canister when I'm off idle. At idle, it should be zero. I'll open the throttle, vacuum comes through. Then, I found that the vacuum canister is not leaking. And I also showed that the vacuum is actually causing 
the engine to increase speed as the timing advances. All that is normal behavior and what I was after. Now the next thing I'm going to do is start the engine again and show what the primary ignition circuit looks like under the oscilloscope. It'll be over there. Okay, I'm coming around to the scope. And what I want to show is the ignition circuit. If I can get up where I want it. Hold on. There we go. Bring this back down. I'm running at just about 550 RPM. I'm running at, boy, I don't like that. Let me see. Here we go. 12. It shows 43 degrees of dwell. So my dwell angle is much too high with these points. It could be because the points have worn down and retards ignition timing and makes the dwell longer. And here, we see what happens when we have a buildup of power, points open, it collapses, and as the magnetic field collapses and causes secondary voltage to spike out, it causes some voltage to build up in the primary circuit as well, and then it trails off and builds again. So I just want to see what that pattern looked like with the points. On the secondary side, we can see Points clap, build, there's a spike of about, let's see if I can get a measurement, 11 to 12,000 volts of current or of a voltage to the ignition coil to cylinder one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, etc. The rest is in there. And so, The spike goes to about 10 or 11,000 volts, but we take a look, the spark line is a lot lower. It's only about three or 4,000 volts. So now I'm going to go ahead, now that I have a baseline, I'm going to turn off the engine. And I'll have Linda videotape me changing out the Pertronics unit and the coil. And then we'll start the engine again and see what's different on the oscilloscope. Before I install the Pertronics module, the igniter module, I'm going to go ahead and install the ignition coil. The ignition coil currently is sitting down here. I guess more light on that. Sitting down here near the carburetor. Yours might be in a different location. They tend to move them from time to time in manufacturing. 
So I'm going to take off the primary leads. One is a slip on. The other is threaded on some nut. I'll take out the high voltage center coil wire. And then on the other side of this bracket, it's bolted. The bracket is bolted to the intake manifold. So I'm going to take out that mounting bolt. And then there's a screw and thread in the bracket that tightens around the coil. So my next move will be to loosen it. New coil goes in as the old one comes out. Bolt it down and get ready to connect things electrically. The difference is there's a pigtail from the distributor going to the negative terminal of the coil currently. The black Petronics wire is going to go there instead. And all the wires going to the positive side of the coil, well, I'll keep them there. But the red wire from the module is going to go on further over to the throttle position solenoid pigtail to get full 12 volts coming in for the module. The coil having positive power to the red terminal has to be there for other purposes. There has been a modification of some sort that somebody did on this vehicle. I believe it's for the tachometer for the Dakota VHX instrument panel. It uses a Ford style tachometer electrically, which works off the positive side of the coil, not the negative side. So I'm going to cut here because this next step is rather boring. And once I have the new coil in place, I'll come back. Unless something comes up, I think is noteworthy. I found the bolt that the bracket for the ignition coil is mounted to. It is an intake manifold bolt with a 9 16 head. And it's a little bit difficult to get to unless you have a swivel socket like I have here. And then that bolt is capable of getting dropped in all kinds of places, we don't want to drop it just because it'll be a pain to get to later. It might have been easier for me to take off the carburetor so I get my hands down there, but I'm going to try to do without that. Meantime, I have it unbolted. I haven't picked the bolt up yet. I'll do that off camera. In fact, let me have the link to hand me the camera. I'll show you why it's a problem. Thank you. Way down there, center of the screen, is the bolt that's holding the bracket for the ignition coil. And that is in a really, really tough spot to get to. Anyway, I'll be back in a moment. Here's the ignition coil and the bracket. I'm going to unscrew this small bolt that holds the tension on the bracket. Pull out the old coil and put in the new one, and then I'll assemble it. Before I replace the ignition coil, I thought it might not be a bad idea to read the instructions. I'm glad I did. First, here, this is a 1.5 ohm internal resistance coil. Externally, it is a little longer than the stock coil, about the same diameter, and the primary terminals are directly across each other as opposed to the stock unit where the terminals are closer to each other on one side of the coil. So physically, there's a small difference. Then, I read the instructions. Pretty hard to believe, huh? 
and it says to measure the positive coil terminal for voltage. If it's less than battery voltage, you have a resistor. We have a resistor. Then it says review the chart on the back page to ensure proper usage. So I come over here. We have a 1.5 ohm coil with an eight cylinder engine. It says remove the resistor. Well, I'm not gonna remove the resistor. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to bypass it or cap it off. There's a few ways I can do this. From the throttle position solenoid, I can simply move it to the positive terminal of the coil. So that's where the power to the coil will be, and it will permeate the rest of the ignition system on the primary side, including the starter, um, uh, starter relay. That would be the easiest thing to do, take up the least amount of wire. So that is what I plan to do. Okay, half the igniter with the red and black wire. What I'm gonna do now is I'm going to take off the distributor cap. There's two hold down clips. I don't know if Linda can get a good picture of that or not. Mm -hmm. And I'm just go under it with a screwdriver and pop it off and do the same for the other side, which is our camera view. Then I take the rotor and remove it temporarily. It goes back in the distributor later, but not yet. Then, see if I can get this hold somewhere out of the way. I will unscrew the screws for the points. And if you take a close look, there's a copper braided ground strap that goes back on. That provides a good ground connection between the points or the igniter module and the ground electrically for the rest of the vehicle, which is important. Without that, you may have a poor connection and unusual impact with your ignition system where it might permanently or intermittently cause a problem. Because intermittent, it's hard to find the cause of those. Now I'm trying to get the screw out from the ground strap without losing the screw. And of course it's being difficult just because the ground strap eyelet is so small. But I got it. There's the eyelet, there's a tiny screw. Can you turn the light on and get down inside the distributor, please? Now down here inside the distributor, there's another screw. I don't know if Linda can get an angle on that or not. But it comes out as well. In the old days, I used to be able to do this blindfolded because I did it so often. But now, I've got to watch every tiny little piece to make sure I'm getting them all. Now here, I have a nut that's holding the negative lead from the pigtail that goes to the negative side of the distributor. And I have another lead going to the condenser. It showed the assembly of the points and condenser held together right here. Now normally I would take off this nut, but in this case we're replacing the entire lead for the distributor. So 
I'll pull and take it off in one piece and put it to one side. Then I take the igniter and I take the two terminal ends and push them through where the pigtail had been with the previous wire. Notice we have two wires and not one. And once I have them in there, I can pull them through. And as I get the igniter into position, Now, on the bottom of the igniter, there's a small nub next to my finger that goes in the hole. There's a little hole down here. I knew it was around there somewhere. Now we have a little reluctor ring. So we slip this down on top of the distributor shaft. Right. Okay, we have the igniter module installed but not tightened down so it's installed in place but not secure yet we have a magnetic wheel also called a reluctor it goes on the distributor shaft from above and it is designed to fit down over the eight can lobes for the ignition point rubbing block from before. There are four slots here, and it doesn't matter how I put this down, as long as it sits down in there, all four line up like they should. So here it is going down, and what I did is I ro rotated this until I felt it bite, and push it down. So now the magnetic ring is in place. Now, if you hand me that plastic thing, we should have in here a little gapping tool, and we do. And what I do with that is I adjust the air gap between the magnetic ring and the igniter module. The thickness of this little piece of plastic is 0 0.03 inch, three hundredths of an inch. So it's small. And the bag is not easy to open, not for me at least. I have to explain something. You look like you're sweating like a pig. He's not. It's actually pouring out. Yeah, it's very humid today. He's just walking around the car and he keeps getting drenched. <laughs> Okay, there is my gapping tool. Let me get close up that. Very thin, three hundredths of an inch. And I put it down between the magnetic ring and the surface, inside surface of the igniter. Once it's there, I tighten down Good. No need to make this so tight this strips the screw. Just tight enough to secure things. And <clears throat> make sure these wires are not underneath that plate. Some folks might laugh at me saying that, but I saw one YouTube video where someone was installing the system and they got that wire, the black wire underneath the plate. Might not have been a problem, but it could have been. Now I'm going to pull the pigtail seal through. What I'm trying to do is pull that pigtail until it clips into place and won't push back in. Then I can pull the wires a little bit. I don't want to make this too tight. 
but I want to make sure that the wires are not needlessly rubbing on anything metallic in there, including the housing of the distributor itself. That looks good. Okay. Now, I put that initial rotor somewhere safe where I wouldn't lose it. Okay, I found, Linda found the rotor. I take my measuring tool out. I'll double check that gap. And, yep. The rotor tip lines up with this little cup and the shaft. So I put it in, wait for it to drop, and then I rotate the rotor back and forth, the spring loaded, to make sure that nothing is going to rub on those wires. Nothing is. So now I'll put the cap on. There's a small cutout here. That lines up with the screw over here holding the vacuum dance diaphragm in place. Once that's in place, there's two clips that were holding that cap in position before get pushed down and locked in. And that can sometimes be a problem just because it's such an unusual spot. But I got it. Now, I'm going to go ahead and do the wiring for the voltage from the throttle position solenoid, 12 volts, over to the ignition coil. For some reason, our audio stopped working for about nine minutes. So I'm going to try to fill in with some narration what I'm doing. Here, I was holding the connector for the throttle position solenoid. And that little black wire leads to the solenoid. And the other side is the red wire with yellow hash marks. And it is the yellow wire with yellow hash marks I'm going to tap into with what's called a scotch lock splice. And usually, only one wire goes all the way through the splice, one end to the other, and the other wire goes in and stops. In this case, I want to have my pink wire from the distributor passing all the way through the splice, as well as my harness wire, which is red and yellow hash. After that, I use a pair of pliers to press down on a metal blade, and the metal blade will cut through the insulation of the wires, and then an electrical connection will be made between the two wires. Here I'm just pushing the pink wire into place. Now I crush the blades in there, and you can see the blade's edge on the outside of the pink wire. And at this point, I'll simply close the little cover latch until it snaps in place. There we go, snapped. Okay, and then I'll push that away from other stuff so nothing rubs it. Now the other end of the wire, I'm going to terminate with an eyelet connection after I make sure I'm still getting voltage to it. So I'll go ahead and connect up my test light. And then I'll go turn the ignition key to the run position to make sure that the splice worked and is sending voltage to the pink wire. And there, the light is on. So the scotch lock splice worked. 
Now I'll turn off the ignition and then I'll come back over and finish terminating the end of that pink wire so we can attach it to the ignition coil. Uh, looks like I'm doing something else here. I didn't turn the run switch off yet. Maybe I'm going to measure, there we are, it's measuring the voltage, 11.9, uh, call it 12 volts. So I am getting 12 volts, not 6.3, like I did through the resistor wire. So I am getting full battery voltage through there like I wanted. Now the voltage in the battery is a little bit low because the headlights are on any time the ignition key is turned to the run position. When the alternator is turning with the engine, it brings that voltage up to about 12.5, 12.6 volts. So now I'm making sure the wire is long enough, the pink wire is long enough to reach the coil. And making sure that everything is put into a position where nothing ends up getting caught by other mechanical machinery down there in the engine. So now I'm going to get the eyelet terminal and take it out of the little plastic bag. I'll now take my stripper cutter crimping pliers and I'll strip off a little more of the insulation at the end of the wire. And after I strip off that insulation, I'll twist the wires a little bit just to keep the strands together. And then I'll place the wire into the terminal. And once I make sure that the wire is through to the terminal, I use my electrical pliers and I will crush the barrel that the wire is going through. After that, I'll tug on it to make sure that it is a snug fit and the wire is not moving around. Now I turn my attention to the old positive lead that went to the positive side of the ignition coil. On the previous positive wire going to the ignition coil, I cut the wire and put into there a spade connector just so I could unplug and replug it in down the road if I ever wanted to. Uh, but I don't plan to use it for anything, so I'm going to move it out of the way in a few moments. But first, we'll look back over here at the pink wire. I want to make sure that it's not hung up on anything. So now I'm going to take the pink wire or red wire from the module and route it down under, out of the way of other hoses and wires in the engine. And so I'm putting it underneath the ignition cables near the distributor and it's popped out in an area very close to where the coil is going to be mounted. And I found the white wire that goes to the negative post of the coil. The old wire that used to go to the distributor before is gone, but now I have a new black wire that goes to the negative post on the ignition coil. And I'm going to go ahead and strip the end of that and put an eyelet on there for a terminal as well. And there, like magic is done. I must have had to skip a piece in there for a reason. Anyway, on the right, the pink wire is attached to the positive. On the left, the black and white wires are attached to the negative post. The white wire goes to a tachometer on the instrument panel. Now that I have all of those in place and snugged up, I can start to take a look 
at the coil mounting bracket. The next step is to get the bracket that holds the ignition coil, put it around the coil, and there's a small screw and nut. As part of the bracket assembly, I tighten down to hold the coil. And then the bracket and coil got moved into position where I could put the retaining bolts back into the intake manifold like it had come from originally. Now for some reason, I am missing that part of the video. So I'll leave it to you to figure that out. It's easy. Okay, we have everything connected. I have hooked up our son of the oscilloscope to the coil wire, number one plug wire. I have a timing light that is also a number one ignition wire and to the battery and to ground. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold the camera as Linda goes to the car and starts it. Now, I say starts it, confident that it will run first time. We will see. Better. Off she goes. Linda is in the driver's seat of the vehicle. She will try to start this in a moment. Meantime, I have connected our oscilloscope and timing light to the engine. And the reason for the timing light is because when these Pertronics modules get installed, it is entirely possible for the ignition timing to have changed. So once the engine is running, I will unplug the vacuum advanced diaphragm. And when the idle is down to about 600 RPM or less, I will check the ignition timing to see if it's anywhere around six degrees before top dead center. Okay, light her up. Okay, here she comes. I'm gonna unplug the bank of advanced diaphragm temporarily. Then I will check the ignition timing. The RPM is a little bit high. Could you open the throttle a little bit to wrap it? Perfect. Okay, this is the secondary ignition. The firing line is just about 9 to 10 kilovolt where it spikes. The spark line starts at about, it says 1 to 2 kilovolts and drops down from there. two to three. It's looking pretty good. The ignition timing used to be set at seven degrees before top dead center. After putting Pertronics in there, it moved to about 16 degrees before top dead center. So I gained nine degrees. So I had to back it down to six degrees before top dead center, otherwise the engine might start to ping with the gasoline we have out here. Anyway, the spark lines look good, everything looks good. It's working. So now we're gonna put all the equipment away and call it a day.